Hello, everyone. This is Onward to Victory, a Notre Dame football podcast, and I am your host, Alex Painter. Thank you for electing to join me here for this episode, the 16th in our chronology of the University of Notre Dame, its football team, and its fascinating history and people. So I hope you've had an opportunity to listen to the last couple episodes, our first and second in the Notre Dame in the Civil War three-part series. Just for a quick recap, the first, titled The Student Turned Soldier, details the service of Frank Baldwin, an Elkhart, Indiana native who withdrew from Notre Dame as a first year and enlisted in the Union Army in 1861. I thought it was a wonderful story about uh, dedication, sacrifice, and steadfastness. And the second was titled The Priest, was about the bravery of the Union Army's Irish Brigade and their chaplain, Notre Dame's own Father William Corby, and how he raised his hand in absolution for the men and boys of the brigade just mere moments before deploying in the vicious, bloody action of the second day of the Battle of Gettysburg which served as something of a turning point in the entire conflict. So, And you could even argue that the Irish Brigade's counterattack uh, right after Father Corby's absolution was a turning point in that particular battle, which was a turning point in the war. So the Fearless Sons of Aaron, which is another name for the Irish Brigade, fueled by Father Corby's moving declaration of forgiveness of their sins, lost over half of their number in the counterattack. But as I mentioned, it was a successful one. So go back and give... The first two installments in the series, as well as the 13 other previous episodes, a listen if you haven't already. I'm not saying you'll become an expert on all things Notre Dame if you listen to the show, but I can guarantee your fandom of the greatest college football program in the land will feel much more grounded with a strong sense of the remarkable history surrounding the school and its people. Judging by the amount of people who tuned in, I am proud to say that it would seem that the Father Corby episode was enjoyed by many of you. In just a short amount of time, particularly when considering the show's lifespan at this point, the Father Corby episode has actually launched into the top five of most listened to episodes in show history, so thank you very much. If you're new around here first, welcome, but then you may be wondering why a Notre Dame football podcast is talking about the American Civil War events that transpired over a century and a half ago. If I could quote the great Irish quarterback Joe Theismann, who once said, quote, if you could find a way to bottle the Notre Dame spirit, you could light up the universe, end quote. That spirit extends to everyone directly, like, say, Father William Corby, or indirectly, say, like us listening to this podcast. And that started way back in 1842 when the school was founded in the northern Indiana wilderness and continues today. Uh, when the football team runs out of the tunnel and into the house that Rockney built. So anyways, here's a friendly, couple friendly reminders, I should say. If you dig the show, you can find it on the Apple Podcasts app. So the purple icon, if you have an iPhone, or Spotify, as well as Podbean at onwardtovictory.podbean.com. Please like, subscribe, do whatever you got to do to make sure you're getting all the new episodes. And please interact with the show on the Facebook page at facebook.com slash onward to victory. And you can send the show a good old-fashioned electronic mail, yes, email, at onward to victory podcast at gmail.com. Now, if you'd like to name yourself to the Onward to Victory Consensus All-American Squad, you can do so very simply. A $10 donation to the show will sponsor an episode and get your name called out on that episode as a Consensus All-American over the air. You can donate at paypal.me slash onward to victory for a one-time donation, or if you feel like you want to donate a certain amount per month, that'd be awesome, visit patreon.com slash onward to victory podcast. So why pay for a show that you can get for free anyways? Um, so the sh- all the monies that come into the show by way of Patreon or PayPal go directly back into the show for promotion, uh, you know, for uh, better subscription services, for research, and all that. So it is greatly, greatly appreciated. So uh, And as always, any support is greatly appreciated. So this also includes liking, listening, sharing, and corresponding. Uh, which is, of course, always free. So, as always, thank you to Joseph Rakish, who allows the show to use his song, Knut Rockney, as the theme. And you can find the jam on Spotify, iTunes, SoundCloud, or YouTube. So give it a spin. 
As I mentioned in the last episode, I'm also working on some curing some excuse me. Whew, I am also working on securing some time with author Jeff Harrell, whose book Rockney of Ages will be the newest biography on Irish coach Knut Rockney. Uh, but we'll also deal in depth with the mob bomb theory in regards to Coach Rockney's plane crash. Jeff wrote a very elegant article for Notre Dame Magazine in the spring of 2019 about the theory, which was also the subject of, if you remember, the Onward to Victory True Crime episode, which was episode 10, released in November of last year. Anyways, look forward to that after this Civil War series ends, but head over to KnutRockney.com to learn more about Jeff's project. All right, so per show tradition, we assign a former or current Notre Dame football player who wore or wears the number of episode we are on to represent the show. So, for instance, episode 15, last episode was the Pat Terrell episode, 14 was Red Sitko, 13 was Tom Carter, and so on and so forth. So, f number 16, I should say, is a bit lean in Irish football history, at least from what I could think of, but that's okay. No knock against these guys, but... We could be working with the Tory Hunter Jr., wide receiver for the Irish. Many of you remember him from 2013 through 2016 and the son of former Major League Baseball player Tory Hunter. He tallied 73 catches and six touchdowns in his Notre Dame career, but he actually plays professional baseball uh, these days, splitting last season between the uh, Class A Inland Empire 66ers and the Pioneer League Orem Owls. So that was... Actually, the only player I could think of other than the current players. So, if you can think of one, 16. It's a toughie. Um, I guess this one will be known as the Tory Hunter Jr. episode. Now, my mind immediately went to Joe Montana, who, of course, wore 16 in the NFL. But as we know, or if you've seen uh, tapes of the old uh, 70s you know, national championship game, uh, he, wore, he wore number three for the Irish. So, couldn't be the Joe Montana episode. So, and looking at the current edition of the Irish, we have nine of our former guys heading to the NFL Scouting Combine held between February 23rd and March 2nd in Indianapolis. Included in the mix from the offensive side of the ball includes wide receivers Chase Claypool and Chris Fink, tight end Cole Komet, and running back Tony Jones Jr. On the defensive side of the ball, invitees include defensive lineman Khaled Kareem and Julian Aquara as well as three, three members of the defensive secondary. Some really good ones here, everybody, in Aloe Gilman, Jalen Elliott, and Troy Pride. So on behalf of the show, I want to wish all these guys the best of luck in their combine workouts. And as someone who, in a much, much different era of my life, when I was playing college football, I was able to put up 17 reps on the 225 bench press test. So I always like to see how I would have stacked up against some of these guys uh, notice I only talked about the bench press test and didn't talk about my 40-yard dash for good reason. Anyway, so here we go. This is the third and final part of the Notre Dame in the Civil War series. So let's start with a couple lesser-known Civil War facts, as we have in the previous episodes. I think many of us would like to think that they would prefer to be a general over a private in the Army. So again, highest rank versus lowest rank. But consider this. According to the History Channel, during the American Civil War, generals were 50% more likely to be killed in action than privates. Just wild. The Battle of Gettysburg alone claimed nine generals, and the Battles of Antietam and Franklin in Tennessee both claimed six. So how about that? And how about another one? Most everyone knows that Abraham Lincoln was killed by John Wilkes Booth at Ford's Theater in 1865, right after the end of the Civil War. How about a time that a Booth saved a Lincoln. This is from mentalfloss.com. During the American Civil War, a young Robert Todd Lincoln, who was the son of the president, was traveling by train from New York to Washington during a break from his studies at Harvard. He hopped off the train during a stop at Jersey City, only to find himself on an extremely crowded platform. To be polite as the Lincolns were, Lincoln stepped back to wait his turn to walk across the platform. His back pressed to one of the train's cars. The situation probably seemed harmless enough until the train started moving, which whipped Lincoln around and dropped him in the space between the platform and the train. An incredibly dangerous place to be. Lincoln probably would have been dead meat if a stranger hadn't yanked him out of the hole by his collar. That stranger was none other than Edwin Booth, 
one of the most celebrated actors of the 19th century and brother to eventual Lincoln assassinate, assassin, pardon me, John Wilkes Booth. Lincoln immediately recognized the famous actor. So this would be like if you were pulled out in, in, from a car or in front of a car or your life was otherwise saved by, say, like Brad Pitt or Channing Tatum. This would have been the equivalent. But, uh, you know, he thanked him effusively. So the actor... Booth actually had no idea whose life he actually saved until he received a letter a few months later commending him for his bravery in saving the President of the United States' son. The telegram was reportedly from Union General-in-Chief and future President himself, Ulysses S. Grant. And speaking of Grant, let's segue into talking about one of his most trusted generals during the conflict, William Tecumseh Sherman and his deeply personal connection to the University of Notre Dame. The final episode of Notre Dame in the Civil War, titled The General, will begin right after this. Always nice hearing a little bit of Civil War music in the middle of the day. <laughs> but anyways, William Tecumseh Sherman was born on February 8th, 1820 in Lancaster, Ohio. Based on when this episode is being recorded, it's actually the 200th anniversary of his birth was just celebrated a few days ago. So for some sense of place, Lancaster rests 30 miles southeast of Columbus, Ohio. Sherman was actually born to a prominent family. His father, Charles Roberts Sherman, who was a successful attorney and at one time the 15th justice to serve on the Ohio Supreme Court. He was also a trustee at Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. Sherman's middle name was an ode to the Shawnee chief of Tecumseh, who was the driving force behind the unification of Ohio Native American tribes around the turn of the 19th century. He's also a fierce warrior. His close friends and family always called William Cump. So C-U-M-P, kind of a shortened version of Tecumseh. Sherman was one of 11 children, all left with just their mother when Sherman's father passed away suddenly in 1829. Sherman later wrote of his father's death, quote, Of course father's death was a terrible event in our family of 11 children. I was too young to appreciate it, but it was manifest that it had not been for a large circle of warm friends to help mother, we would have been poor indeed. Mother had absolutely nothing but the house, two or three town lots, and some little bank stock. So large a family was more than she could have cared for without the positive help of friends." End quote. So as he suggested, Sherman at age nine was sent to live with a family friend named Thomas Ewing, who would soon become a U.S. Senator and later the first Secretary of the Interior under President Zachary Taylor. So given from, he was from an influential family and then was sent to live with another influential family and the fact that he was incredibly intelligent, young William was sent to the United States Military Academy at West Point, where he graduated from in 1840. He graduated sixth in his class, but according to his memoirs, he would have actually graduated fourth, but he averaged, get this, 150 disciplinary demerits per year. Now, it's noteworthy to say that disciplinary, like demerits were given for sometimes very menial reasons, but I imagine 150 on average per year is a lot. So needless to say, some of you may have had an academic career like Sherman, a great student, but not necessarily one for the rules. He remained in the Army throughout the 1840s and was actually not sent to the front lines during the Mexican-American War between 1846 and 1848 like many of his colleagues were. He was actually assigned to desk duties in California. And in an interesting quirk in history, he was among the first to spot gold in California in 1848. 
This prompted, of course, the California Gold Rush of 1849, which, of course, leads to the team name of an NFL team, the San Francisco 49ers, also defending NFC champions. Anyways, I digress. Sherman would ultimately marry the daughter of his foster parents, Eleanor Ewing. So, just so it's clear, there was no blood relation. And they were married in 1850. Ellen, as she went by, unlike William, who was Presbyterian, she was a devout Catholic. Within three years, three full years of marriage, the Shermans had two daughters, one named Maria and the other Mary, in 1851 and 1852, respectively. In 1853, he resigned his captaincy in the army and took a job at a bank in San Francisco. But by the end of the decade, Sherman's bank had failed, and he and Eleanor had three more children, William, nicknamed Willie, Thomas, and Eleanor. They would ultimately have eight children of their own. As we covered in previous episodes, the American Civil War broke out in April of 1861 when Confederate artillery bombarded Fort Sumter, a Union-held base in the Charleston, South Carolina Harbor. Due to both its remoteness and the fact that his wife was a devout Catholic, William sent Eleanor with the children to South Bend shortly after the war had broke out. Sherman accepted a brigade, which was a unit of a few regiments, so 3,000 or so men, which he led at the Battle of First Bull Run in July of 1861, which was the first major land battle of the conflict taking place in the eastern theater of the war. So while the war was raging across the middle and southern parts of the country, Sherman arranged for his family to head north, as what was previously mentioned. And he actually had his children enrolled at Notre Dame and St. Mary's College. Interestingly, about half of the colleges and universities in America closed during the Civil War, oftentimes due to their proximity to the armed conflict, as well as their student bodies being depleted by enlistments. Because of the aforementioned remoteness, even some well-to-do Southern families sent their young students away from the conflict to Notre Dame. And during this time, Notre Dame's enrollment actually increased. This was incredibly rare for a college in the early 1860s. With a healthy blend of nor Northerners and Southerners, can you imagine how interesting of a place Notre Dame must have been at this time? Maria, who the family called Minnie, was enrolled at St. Mary's. The oldest son, the third child, Willie, enrolled in the Minim department at Notre Dame. Now this gave me a little bit of pause. Minim. M-I-N-I-M. -I -I so I wasn't really sure what that was or what that meant, so I looked it up. So as it turned out, according to the school's archives, shortly after the university was founded in 1842, the school had three departments, which were the senior one, the collegiate department for ages 17 and up, junior, which was essentially junior high and high school ages 12 to 17, and finally, the Minims, who were members of the under-12 grammar school. So, believe it or not, this system actually stayed in place until the 1920s. So, Willie was enrolled in the Minim department. Throughout the year 1861, Sherman stayed active, though he did reportedly suffer a nervous breakdown later in the year. A Cincinnati newspaper actually said he had gone, quote, insane. By December of 1861, he had felt that he had recovered adequately, and he actually served at the Battle of Shiloh in April of 1862. If you listen to the first episode of the series about Frank Baldwin, you may remember that Shiloh was the bloodiest day in American history at that time, with more casualties than the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812 combined. Baldwin's 44th Indiana Regiment went into the fight as a member of the 4th Division, Sherman commanded the entire 5th Division, which was a group of roughly four infantry brigades. Like Baldwin, who was wounded in the head at Shiloh, Sherman was hit in the shoulder and in the hand, and had three horses shot from underneath him. Sherman, obviously an intelligent person, certainly gathered a reputation of ruggedness after pressing on multiple times during the fight. Thanks to his bravery and savvy, Sherman was given command of the Army of Tennessee's 15th Corps, so that's C-O-R-P-S, Corps, which was a unit that consisted of multiple divisions. And the 15th Corps was actually formerly under the command of Ulysses S. Grant. 
and he led that corps at the Siege of Vicksburg in 1863, which, paired with the Union victory at Gettysburg, proved to be, militarily anyways, the turning point of the conflict. After the fall of Vicksburg, when the Sherman children returned home for a vacation, Ellen, who was pregnant with the family's seventh child, took the children to visit Sherman at his insistence to the Union Army's encampment in Mississippi to visit with him during a respite in the battles. They spent six weeks at camp, filling their days with love, laughter, and play from, quote, dusk until dawn. Willie actually prided himself as a member of the Army, quote, He took the most intense interest in the affairs of the Army, Sherman later wrote. He was a great favorite with the soldiers and used to ride with me on horseback in the numerous drills and reviews. He was called a sergeant in the regular battalion, learned the manual of arms, and regularly attended the parade and guard mounting of the 13th U.S. Infantry. Willie was, or so he thought he was, a sergeant in the 13th. I have seen his eyes brighten, his heart beat, as he beheld the battalion under arms." End quote. But soon tragedy struck the family. Willie was taken violently ill with what was known as Camp Fever on the day they left Mississippi via steamer for home. Camp Fever is what typhus fever was known as, which was typically caused in the military by camps that were overcrowded and unsanitary. After five days on the river and upon reaching Memphis, Tennessee, Willie was taken from the boat to see the best doctors ashore. But it was too late. The child died the following evening, October 3rd, 1863. Willie was just nine years old. And at his bedside to perform last rites was Father Joseph C. Carrier, a Catholic priest from the University of Notre Dame. William and Ellen were devastated by the loss, and Sherman blamed himself for it his entire life. And they would actually lose another child, young Charlie, just 10 months old, 14 months later. The child was originally buried at Notre Dame's Cedar Grove Cemetery and given last rites by Father Edward Soren, Notre Dame priest and, of course, the founder and president of the university. The body of young Charlie was eventually moved to the family plot in St. Louis. General Sherman had never even seen Charlie. But the deaths of his children changed him, as you might expect. His entire style of waging warfare changed, a style which he would become famous for. A historian later wrote, quote, Did perhaps the death of Willie start a chain reaction of fires and desolation in Mississippi that the winds of more than a century have not entirely hidden? Did Sherman hold Mississippi, that sickly region, quote, responsible for his death? Who knows? Yet we do know that between the end of the Vicksburg campaign and the beginning of the Meridian expedition, only a few months' time, his concept of warfare changed, and he began his own version of the total war for which he became well known. So throughout 1864, possibly literally insane with grief, Sherman crossed the South like a sickle of destruction. In doing so, he blazed a new strategy, still commonly used today, called total war. He disabled, pillaged, confiscated, or destroyed anything that would be of use to the Southern War Machine as he conquered Atlanta in September of 1864. His path was a devastated one. He then embarked upon his famous march to the sea to Savannah, Georgia, where he employed many of the same tactics. His total war efforts made him hated among the South at the time, and frankly, in some parts of the country, the name will still furl many a Southerner's brow, even in 2020. Though historians disagree, it may have been his destructive tactics that helped end the war when it did in April of 1865. Who knows? Despite the brutal nature of total war, it possibly could have saved many lives, both north and south. Sherman was, and is still remembered to this day, as a 
hero of the American Civil War, and he became a celebrity in post-war America. After the war ended, he returned to South Bend to be with his family. A fun fact is that if you live in South Bend or if you have traveled to South Bend or drove through South Bend, you will find actually both a Sherman and a Ewing Street named for the families of Ellen and William. So they actually attended Notre Dame's commencement in July of 1865, where Sherman was actually called to give an impromptu speech to the new graduates. Even with kind of a lack of preparedness, he was able to deliver a fairly rousing ovation for the exercises. Quote, So I call upon the young men here to be ready at all times to perform bravely the battle of life. We might not ever have to go to war anymore on this continent, but again, we might. War is possible, and we must be ready for that contingency. But more than this, I want to say that there is a kind of war which is inevitable to all. It is the war of life. A young man should always stand in his armor, with his sword in hand and his buckler on. Life is only another kind of battle, and it requires as good a generalship to conduct it to a successful end as it did to conquer a city or march through Georgia, end quote. Which is about the commencement speech you'd expect out of a general who just wrapped up four years of warfare and kind of a subtle nod to his own exploits in the state of Georgia. But Sherman would stay in the limelight his entire life, and he was actually asked on multiple occasions to run for president. He had no interest in the position, famously stating, quote, if drafted, I will not run. If nominated, I will not accept. If elected, I will not serve, end quote. Ellen died in 1888 at age 64. William Tecumseh Sherman died on February 14, 1891, exactly 129 years ago today as of this recording. He was 71 years old. And you know, he found peace in death, whereas maybe he didn't find it in life. While he did mourn Willie his entire life for the rest of it, his instructions for burial included that he be placed, quote, alongside my faithful wife, Ellen, and idolized soldier boy, Willie. We'll be right back. three-part series, Notre Dame in the Civil War, with episodes The Student Turned Soldier, The Priest, and The General, would have been much more difficult if not for the work of author and researcher James A. Schmidt, whose book, published in 2010, titled Notre Dame and the Civil War, Marching Onward to Victory, is utterly essential reading if you are interested in this subject matter. I actually kicked around the idea of making this a five-part series instead of three, but I think I correctly figured that five episodes probably would have been a bit too long, uh, even though I get the sense that a lot of you are interested in, uh, in this kind of thing. Five episodes on Notre Dame and the American Civil War might be a bit long for a football podcast. And, you know, and I know parts of these episodes can be you know, a real bummer. I think it's really important to give ourselves an authentic, as authentic of a view of history as possible. And often we really have a tendency to look at it with rose-colored glasses. As someone who really loves history and is passion about, passionate about history, it's always really important to think back and know that there are parts of, of our story that are dirty and gritty and frankly can be extremely gut-wrenching. And I'm guilty of the rose-colored view of history oftentimes myself, but when you look at this era, what's really jarring is the mortality rate. During the American Civil War, death was absolutely 
everywhere. I, I can't, I, I simply can't imagine living in a society where essentially everybody probably knew multiple people who had been killed in the conflict and naturally, statistically, even more who would have been maimed for the rest of their lives. The average lifespan in 1860 was 45 years old, and much of that was thanks to the war, but also obviously incurable sicknesses at that time, and deaths among children were rampant, including young Willie Sherman. I loved studying the Civil War, and this series was a bit of a collision of, my two, of two of my passions, I should say, so I really do appreciate you indulging me with it. I hope you enjoyed it as well, too. So I'm very eager for the upcoming episodes. So as always, jump over to the Facebook page. Just search Onward to Victory, a Notre Dame football podcast, and you'll get there. That's headquarters, HQ, whatever. I call it a little bit of both. But um, go to Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or Podbean, and make sure that you're subscribed to the show, please. That is the lifeblood of the show, and that's how I know that people are getting the new episodes when they're released. So sincerely, whatever, however you're listening to this right now, um, whether it's, like I said, Spotify, Apple, or Podbean, you know, subscribe as a follower, um, follow the show, please. That way uh, you can continue to get the content. So uh, if you haven't already, please go back and listen to parts one and two of this series I humbly say that they are fantastic and I think incredibly interesting. And these episodes, as you might guess, take a fair amount of time to research, write, record, edit, release, then promote. So if you want to support the show, please consider becoming a Consensus All-American by donating just $10. That will get you a spot on the All-American list and a sponsor for an entire episode. Interested parties, please head over to paypal.me slash onward to victory for a one-time donation or patreon.com slash onward to victory podcast if you just like to donate a few bucks every month. Anything is supported. Please know that all support is incredibly, incredibly appreciated. So, and I've got some good news to end the show and kind of end the series that while we can all agree that the American Civil War was in fact a good, a good thing that happened in our history, uh, it did come at a great cost, and that cost can be uh, a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit daunting, a little bit jarring, kind of a bummer. So I've got some good news here. Uh, as of this recording, we are a mere 196 days from the Irish opening kickoff over in Aviva Stadium, Dublin, Ireland, on August 29th against the Navy Midshipmen. So it'll, I'm sure that uh, it'll be here before we know it. I know. So, and I know that uh, it's been three weeks since the last episode, and I typically run, or at least I have run the show, essentially, except for kind of the period around the holidays, on an episode every two-week cycle. But I've actually been putting the finishing touches on my second book, which I'm sure you'll hear about it on the show, and I'm really excited for. Um, and of course, just I feel like I need to point this out because I do feel bad. I do like to release things very consistently, mostly because I, I have a passion for learning things. And so oftentimes I'm not tackling subjects or things for this show that I know everything about. Uh, I'm very meticulous about learning uh, and, and learning new things and sharing them. So that's typically why episodes are chosen. So the episodes, the, sh the show, the, my, any books that I've read, any all of this stuff, they're all just passions and hobbies. And I actually have a full-time job elsewhere. And I'd be remiss not to mention I'm married and have three small children. So any and all of your support is awesome. So this has been Onward to Victory, a Notre Dame football podcast, episode 16. You know what? The Tory Hunter Jr. episode. And in kindness, I am your host, Alex Painter. And as always, go Irish. <laughs>